Good evening and welcome to this evening's uh, monthly MacMira Swedish Whiskey Tasting. How are we all tonight? I'm Mickey Plummer and joined as always by my good friend and co-host Rich McKean. Good evening, Rich. Good evening, Mickey. Good everyone joining from home. Uh, happy to be here once again. So, um, thank you for, for, for joining us this evening uh, to to all the, to the new and to the old uh, and everybody else. Um, come, come on for, for the journey of Mac Mira. Um, so this is how the tasting is going to work. We're going to start off with some brief announcements. Then we'll do a, a, a quick introduction of uh, the history of Mac Mira. We're only 21 years old, so it shouldn't take too long. Um, so we'll, like I said, we'll keep that part short and we can get into the drums quick, more quickly because, you know, that's the main reason why we're here, let's be honest. Uh, we'll expand on some of the points uh, and dot go a bit deeper as we progress on to each dram uh, and then you know we'll fire into some whiskey so rich what's tonight's run in order please sir yes so um the the first whiskey that we're starting with is the brooks whiskey then it'll be the the mac just so that everyone can get things lined up uh then into the bjork sav then the svensk yak or svensk ek and uh, and then finishing things off with the Svensk Rook or Svensk Rock, but uh, yeah, the Rook is uh, how one uh, should say it. Who should one? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go through and discuss uh, each each whiskey one by one, guys. Uh, uh, we suggest having a glass of water to hand, uh, as well as a small jug or a pipette and a straw, a uh, pipette or a straw, should I say? Um, just to, just to, you know, sometimes you might want to add a little bit of water to your whiskey, and there's nothing wrong with that if you do that, by the way. Me and Rich do do, do, do that as we uh, go through the tasting. And I said do do. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's all about drinking responsibly as well, guys, okay? Uh, so there's going to be no massive rush for this, but don't don't feel the need to pour, pour the whole dram, okay? Just just a, a little splash, each whiskey uh, will be perfectly fine. Um, so, Rich, uh, so before we get into announcements and stuff, guys, go ahead and pour yourself a, uh, your, your Brooks whiskey uh, and start having a nose with that. Me and Rich will do a bit more talking and we'll come on to tasting notes and a bit more about the Brooks as, as we get into it. So, But uh, as we've done that, guys, as the people are pouring away there, Rich, uh, have we got any deals or a, any announcements coming up? Yeah, so we've got uh, we've got one offer on tonight that runs from uh, from seven pm, so as of four minutes ago until midnight tonight. Uh, if uh, if you buy from macmira.co.uk a bottle of Bjork Sav, um, you'll be able to receive forty percent off of a, a core range bottle, which is any of the other four bottles that we have. Um, to do that, uh, the discount code um, when you get to checkout. Um, Bjork Sav uh, 40. You don't need to do the umlaut uh, uh, over the, the dots over the O. Uh, Bjork Sav, uh, as a, a British keyboard would type. Uh, so Bjork Sav 40. And uh, yeah, buy a bottle of that and you'll get 40% um, off of any of the other bottles that we have uh, this evening. Yeah. Um, uh, announcements, make upcoming shows. Run through those quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah. So um, uh, Mick and I host a, a virtual pub on uh, on Fridays. Uh, uh, we sit um, you know, in our respective homes and we have a, a different VIP patron join us each week. Um, anyone from in the whiskey industry community or just a uh, general creative industries, people that have got some sort of input into uh, how things might be made and uh, different takes on things. Um, we've got that. The last of our Friday sessions uh, is this Friday. Starting at 6 p.m., we were joined by Claire Vokins here, a uh, whiskey blogger, a friend of, of Mac Mira, does some also some work for the Boutique Whiskey Company, if anyone's familiar with them, and um, and uh, and some work at Milroy's of Soho uh, as well, one of the um, sort of the foremost whiskey bars uh, in the UK. Um, yeah, so she's joining us uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. You can find that term on Mac Mira, uh, Mac Mira's uh, YouTube page and Facebook, I believe, as well. We'll broadcast that too. Yeah. And then, um, we, we're off next week and, uh, and moving that show to Wednesdays as the world and or the UK at least sort of transitions back to being allowed out at the weekend. We thought uh, we'd move it to Wednesday. So from Wednesday, um, the 21st, uh, we'll be doing them uh, at 7 p.m. every Wednesday. And uh, we've got Phil Walker and Dave Pennington of um, uh, the Kendall Whiskey, well, or the Ken, Ken new, new What's it called, Mickey? I'm so sorry. So, so Phil runs uh, in, in the new union in Kendall, and Dave nice. Pennington uh, uh, runs a business in Kendall as well. But they're the co-founders of what will be the very first Kendall Whiskey Festival in December, which we're going to be the main sponsors of. That's it. Very good. Thanks for saving me there, Mick, mate. Much, uh, it, much mate. appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, that 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 festival is going to be uh, going to be a good one. I know that uh, that, that us and uh, and Bernard Harvard are booked already, aren't they? So um, interested to uh, to speak to them and, and find out a little bit more. But I think that's it for announcements, Mick. So um, yeah. yeah, over to you. Yeah. So just just to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, this is how you know me and Rich don't write any of this stuff down because <laughs> we miss some things occasionally. Okay, we're only human. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we'll we'll crack on. So guys. Um, Guys and girls, please comment from home uh, as we go. We'll already see a few comments topping up, uh, in, and we'll get to them in a little bit. Uh, so just let us know where you're joining us from. If it's your first time with Mac Mira, your first time at a whiskey tasting, your first virtual whiskey tasting, or if you're just one of our uh, one of our own regulars that's along for a, for well, some more and mine and Richard's uh, great crack. Quite frankly, uh, just let us know where you're tuning in from uh, and how you're finding it so far. Uh, so, Rich, would you start us off by giving us uh, a, a quick History intro to Mac Mira, please. Yeah, be my pleasure. So um, we first started producing whiskey in 1999. Um, the idea came about though the year before in 98 when our eight founders um, are all being friends at, at university studying at various disciplines of, uh, of engineering together, um, all on a skiing holiday, a picture of which you can see here. And uh, all of them by pure coincidence have brought a bottle of, of whiskey along. And um, at some point, you know, during that holiday or, or halfway down the bottle, somebody said, you know, why is nobody making whiskey in Sweden? We are the first single malt whiskey distillery um, in Sweden. And, um, yeah, you know, a huge fan base of, of for whiskey in general over there. And, um, yeah, they asked the question, why is no one making it? And they uh, they set about doing it. So one of the things, um, one of the key things at the very beginning that uh, they set out to achieve was to be quintessentially Swedish because they were the first you know, they wanted to, you know, they saw it as their responsibility to set a, a precedent almost and just not try and be another Scottish whiskey distillery that happened to be in another country. You know, uh, do use Swedish ingredients, Swedish methods and processes, which we'll cover in, in a lot of detail when we get to certain whiskies. Um, other things they set out was, you know, to, to be innovative. And I think with some of the whiskies that we'll discuss tonight, we'll, uh, you know, we'll show some evidence of that and how that's continued over the 20 years that we've been going, 21. Um, and the, the third sort of key pillar was um, sustainability, um, for which we won an award, uh, the, the Icons of Whiskey, um, a few months ago, Mick. Um, yeah. yeah a, a sustainable of the dis sustainable <laughs> distillery of the year in the world. Uh, in the, in the, yeah, in the, in the rest of the world whiskey category, yep. That's it. So, um, yeah, and we will talk quite a lot about that because that's that's something that's integral to, to us um, e even now and, and the way that we operate and, uh, and work. Yeah, um, yeah. So since since 99, we've been in, in three locations. So uh, a, a few uh, sheds and, and gardens of the, the <laughs> founders in the, in the early sort of, you know, two, two or three years. Then we moved into the Brooks Distillery uh, in 2002, which was our home uh, until 2011 and 2012 when we moved into the Gravity Distillery, which we'll touch on in, in, and expand on. But big 35 metre tall vertical distillery starts at the top, works its way down, saves an enormous amount of energy. 
and, uh, and a, a much lower carbon footprint than a traditional distillery. Um, we've got warehouses all over Sweden and a few uh, in, in other countries as well, but we've got warehouses on, on islands, um, one on top of a mountain, um, one down in the mines as well, where um, almost the, well, the vast majority of our stock uh, matures down in the Bodas mines, which is a, an old uh, disused um, iron ore mine. Um, 50 meters below ground so uh, good to keep your whiskey out of the swedish cold uh, down there um, we've got three key ranges two of which we're trying this evening so our core range core range uh, for you know any whiskey company is something that's going to be the same year after year batch after batch um, you know what you're getting you know whether or not you haven't bought a bottle in two or three years it should be you know the same when you come back to it um, and and in that core range you've got some of our, our sort of flagship whiskies things that you know showcase you know who we are what we do um, second range we have seasonal range so that comes out uh, we have two limited edition releases a year one is our spring summer release which we're trying one of this evening the latest one this evening and um, then we have an autumn winter release as well and they're about showcasing our, our spirit character in various different ways and in line with or in keeping with whichever sort of prevailing season uh, is around. Uh, and then our moment range as well, which is our sort of uh, top range, uh, very limited in number, highly exclusive um, bottles of whiskey, which are more about showcasing what, what wood or, you know, the, the effects um, that different types of casks and things can have uh, on there as well. Um, Angela Donaccio is our master blender, but we, uh, we, we know her as our, our chief nose officer, um, CNO. Um, she creates all of our whiskies. Uh, she's a, a whiskey magazine Hall of Famer, I believe the second woman to be inducted. There we go. There's Angela um, into the whiskey magazine um, Hall of Fame. And uh, she's responsible for, yeah, for all of the whiskies we have uh, here this evening. Um, so that's it. I think there's a, there's a whistle stop tour, Mick. I mean, that's it. 20, 20 years in a nutshell. Obviously, there's loads more information than that you can access. You know, yeah. if you look at our, our website and things as well. And, uh, you know, you and I will go through some of that. In a bit more detail expand a bit tonight so um yeah i dare say you know people have had brooks whiskey in their glass for a few minutes now yeah, um, let's, talk, yeah let's, let's, talk about let's move into it yeah definitely rich definitely so, so what you've got in your glass now you've got some whiskey <clears throat> it's uh 41.4 percent abv it's light it's bright it's fruity uh gently spiced uh what we call our, our breakfast friend or our breakfast whiskey but what we mean is it's it's good to start off with, okay? We're, not, we're definitely not um, advocating whiskey for breakfast, you know, unless you're on holiday and you're that way inclined, and that's fine. We're not judging you. Uh, but I'd say, so it's nice. It's just nice and easy to uh, to get into. Okay, so the casks that go into making uh, making this up uh, are 200 litre first fill bourbon casks. Uh, so pretty much industry standard there. Um 100 litres, so half that size, of first filled Swedish oak casks that have contained our elegant recipe or our, our non-peated recipe, our non-smoky recipe. 100 litre first filled sherry casks from our elegant recipe as well. And 200 litre ex-bourbon cask, but they've done what's called our smoke tail. We'll touch upon that uh, as we go through. Uh, but So if you do pick up a, a small hint of, of smoke through it, that's why. Uh, there is a very, very small hint of smoke in there. I personally, I don't get it. I don't get it on my nose. I don't get it on the palate either. That's why we start, not because of my palate, but that's why we start off with it because, you know, if you do get it, it is very, very gentle and it's not going to override any um, prevailing flavours, basically. So, yeah, which, like I said, we've done this first because it, I, I, I think, and, and, you know, most of us think that it's it's got quite the, the, the most softest profile but it also allows us to talk about the early days of MacMira. So you know, Rich Rich spoke you know our first um our, our first big boy distillery essentially was in MacMira Brook. But when we first began producing in ninety nine, like when Rich said, uh, I found we used a one hundred litre still. Handmade by the founders, hand welded. Um so that produced there it is that that, that produced um roughly a thirty litre cup which then coincidentally led us on to create um, our 30 litre casks, which, as you can see, they're heavily charred uh, on the cask ends there. That's a particular special cask makeup, which we'll talk about as we go through as well. But, um, yeah, so the 30 litre cask really helped build our profile, really. It allowed, I think we're up to about 20,000 30 litre casks sold in our, in our cask program, Rich. That's about right, isn't it? Yeah, I think I think it's a little over that now. Um, yeah, yeah, 20, yeah, more than likely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 
So, you know, uh, and that's just fantastic. So that's a growing community, a growing family of, uh, of whiskey enthusiasts uh, that can buy into that. And we'll probably touch on that a little bit later on as well, but that's, a, that's another show that happens with, with Matt. Um, so, yeah, in 2002, we moved into our first proper, our, our first proper professional grown-ups, adults distillery, uh, as it were, at McMira Brook. Uh, so we, we went and purchased two big four side stills, uh, and began producing a much higher volume of spirit. Uh, our wash still comes in at 10,000 litres, and our spirit still is in at 7,000 litres. Big, beautiful copper beauties. There they are. That, that, that's them being uh, lifted uh, off the trailer uh, into the distillery. Um, obviously, most people, you know, well, no foresight. They, they make the majority of, of the copper stills throughout the whiskey industry, and definitely in Scotland anyway. They're up in uh, Forsyth. Uh, so Forsyth are up in in, um, in Scotland. Uh, absolutely fantastic company, uh, really professional, and they, they make some beautiful uh, distilling equipment. Uh, so we stayed at McMira Brook uh, until, until the back end of 2011, beginning of, of, of two, uh, in 2012. Uh, when we moved into a gravity distillery, which we'll talk about uh, on the next drum in a bit more detail. So the Brooks distillery really allowed us to grow and become known on the world stage uh, as, as, as a force to be reckoned with, really. Uh, most of the whiskey we were drinking this evening, actually, was in fact distilled uh, at the Brooks distillery. Um, and that's about a whistle-stop tour we're going to get for the minute for Brooks. Um, has anybody got any questions for that? We've got a few uh, a Welcome. few comments. That um, color effect for us. Hi, Mandy. New to these from Cambridge. That's fantastic. Welcome. Uh, what got you to McMira, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, hi, Katie. Fantastic. First timer. Brilliant. Is that first timer whiskey tasting full stop or just first time in McMira? Uh, Neil, you're in Malvern, beautiful part of the world. Mm. Uh, Laura, second time. Welcome back, Laura. Uh, somehow you drank all the drowned from the last session. Cool. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, you got some more. Uh, that's good. Uh, Stuart Armstrong, uh, Stuart's, a, Stuart's a regular flyer with us. Uh, yeah. driving, not at the same time, not not gear shopper from large North Asia. Fantastic, Stuart, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Patrick, uh, Patrick, uh, our, our, our market head of marketing over in Sweden. Good evening, Patrick. Oh, there's another regular flyer, Kevin. We'll have to watch what we say, Mick, and make sure we get everything right tonight. If Patrick, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go on. Patrick loves us, hopefully. Hi, Patrick. Um, you are. <laughs> You asked, oh, that's a good one, nice with cornflakes. Mick, you asked if anyone had um, any questions. I've, I've, got, I've got one for you. You mentioned about uh, the 30-litre cut. You know, we had a 100-litre yeah. still, the first handmade still. Um, to somebody that doesn't know what you mean when you say cut, can you say, you know, what, what that is? Yeah. yeah, fair point. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, so the cut is the, or the heart of the run, is the usable portion. So you'll get your four shots, yeah, with, uh, uh, which come at there, or the heads, uh, which come at the very beginning. They're very high in alcohol, got lots of heavy flavours in them, which you don't really want. Um, that's when people used to distill their own liquid. They used to drink that straight off the still. That's when you used to get their frame blind drunk from because that high ethanol uh, in the alcohol would literally make you temporarily blind. Uh, so that's where the phrase blind drunk comes from. So you don't really want that. <laughs> uh, and then at the end, uh, at the end is when you've got the tails. So that's when the ABV starts to become really quite low and you get some other um, non desirable flavor compounds and stuff like that as well. So, what we mean by the cut is the heart section, uh, the, the middle section. Uh, that's what we then put uh, into our casks for maturation. Yeah, so, we, so you need to do the cut there. So we just discard discard the the first part, keep the the middle part, and um, put the the last part to the side. But then get roll that in as well. In, uh, yeah. in, in yeah, we, we take the first part and the last part, we put it into a holding container, and then that charges the stills then for the next run, so we don't waste any. What I've always thought was uh, was interesting that with that that one hundred liter still, the first few years of us you know distilling with it was that to fill a two hundred liter cask, you know, we had to do six or seven distillations just to fill a single cask yeah. which is why i think as you mentioned you know the the 30 liter casks were uh you know we, we adopted those and, and started using those more and more just so that we could fill a cask put it to one side do another distillation and then, uh, and yeah. then come up oh and dave uh dave joining us as well this evening good evening, good dave. evening dave. looking forward to having you on the interview return on the 21st 
Uh, we had a few other people, David Gillen and David Wells oh, here in Scotland. Kevin Sippin on the Bjork South currently. Beautiful, Kevin. Happy with that. Oh, there we go. Yep. <laughs> We're on the Boston planet. We're on it. <laughs> uh, Ian Wallace from Holmfirth in West Yorkshire. Brilliant. Uh, David, is there any significance to a lot of your bottlings being 46.1? All right, cool. Um, so 46 is the cutoff, basically, before we go into chill filtration and colour correction, etc. because of uh, alcohol below 46% has a thing called flocculation. That's where it starts to look cloudy in colder temperatures, basically. Uh, I knew I'd get that word in again, Rich. Because of science and chemistry and stuff like that, that doesn't happen. Uh, and Angela found that uh, our liquid fares better uh, in mouth profile and taste sensation uh, at 46.1. Mm. So hopefully that answers your question, David. So, yeah, tasting notes, Mick. What do we think about, about Brooks? What, um, what do you my think? Answer, my, always my tasting note for Brooks whiskey, foam bananas, Rich. Always yeah. that nice tropical tone of, of the banana, but it's it's got the alcohol in it, so it reminds me of those those, those old Tempe sweets foam bananas used to get from the news agents. That yeah. that's my biggest takeaway from Brooks. I, I I love it. Always for me. Um, um, let us know what you're thinking at home as well, because I think everyone's had their their Brooks whiskey in their glass for some time now. So, um, if you can find any anything that's jumping out of the glass at you, um, for me, just to, if anyone needs a. Uh, 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 and not just as Mick said, foam bananas, but um, uh, orchard fruits as well. And, and on the on the on the palate and on the finish, some some sort of soft, warm spices. You know, a little bit of um, not heat, but just something spicy on the back of the tongue. Um, just, a me, bit, yeah. just a little bit there. Just so when when Angela designed, um, you know, all, all the whiskeys well, that we're drinking tonight, and that you know everything that we've we've had out. Um, she looks for for balance to create some balance to it. So you should be able to get our spirit character. I might define um, as uh, fruit, fruity, um, a little spicy, and um, and some sort of herbal or herbaceous notes floating around in the background to it. Um, and that I think the um, the Brooks whiskey. I think you can get all of that come through uh, for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. So Katie's Katie's on board with the phone. That's for sure. Yeah. Before we head into this, yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. So before we head into, uh, uh, we, we get Rich to take us over, Mac, we've got a few others. So uh, Michael uh, Michael Hosler from London. Um, first time enjoying Mac Mirror, but certainly not your first whiskey tasting. Fantastic. How are you finding it, Michael? How are you finding it so far? Please let us know as we go through. Uh, Dave Pennington's looking forward to it. Brilliant. Definitely looking forward to meeting you, Dave. Uh, Kim always tastes pear, one of her favourites. Beautiful. Yeah, that, that orchard fruit that Rich was on about. You definitely get that, don't you, Rich? Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. 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 Katie agrees with me. Yeah, dancer. Happy with that. I always like it. It's just nice to be reaffirmed that I'm not actually going mental. Well, Mick, gone, that could have gone that could have gone either way because depending on, on, on who's leading it, it's you know, one one of one of either of us will say that first, yeah. But I'll give you credit this yeah. evening for it. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Uh, so uh, Stuart's gone for the deep fried option and gone for banana fritters right at the end. Nice, Stuart, like it. Uh, oh, great. nice, nice. Yes, boom, bananas, nice one. Uh, Mr. Davidson or Miss Davidson? Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce that, whatever yeah. that's going to be. Yeah. Uh, no, no, getting a, a bit of vanilla and a sweet bit, oh, a bit of fennel. Nice, mm. nice. That, yeah. uh, Mandy has the taste of... Uh, the taste you get with bourbon cask, beautiful. Yeah, majority of the whiskey in this is from bourbon. Uh, it's from bourbon casks. Lovely after taste, get the heat, but more of warmth in the back of the mouth. Yeah, that that light spiciness to give you that warmth. Yeah, no, definitely, I agree. I agree. Mm. So, guys, uh, absolutely fantastic interaction so far. Please keep this going as we go through the show. Any questions whatsoever? Please fire them into the comments, uh, and and Connor, uh, who's our director this evening, uh, calls a way to get a uh, uh, face reconstruction um, to, to be better looking for going out into the general public. It's, <laughs> not, it's not fair saying that because no one knows who you're talking about, Mick. Yeah. <laughs> well, we always mention Carl, don't we, when we're well, doing these yeah. things? You know what I mean? So, I, say, I, I say no one knows. Our, our regulars that are here with us tonight will know uh, know who Carl is, but yeah. Um, well. Uh, Fantastic. Fantastic. So we've got any more. Experimented with water, spoiled it completely. Oh, that's unfortunate, David. Uh, but at least you know that's now, but, you know, next time maybe don't put water. Uh, Robert, Robert, 
Mick, Mick, you you said about um, about not pouring the whole um, at fifty mil drown. So hopefully, yeah, yeah. Uh, hopefully, David, you, you might not have poured the whole thing and then uh, added water and uh, and ended up not uh, not enjoying it um, and just just pouring a, a, a little bit in. Um, adding water to it, I think you mentioned Mick at the beginning about adding a bit of water to it. I um I'll always try a whiskey neat for the first always, time. Yeah always try it neat for the first time and then add add water to taste if i'm not too keen on it as it is i think it needs a bit of water to take an edge off or to, to soften it a little bit perhaps um i'll add a drop of water if that's not enough i'll add a splash and um and enjoy it very much uh however it comes after that fantastic yeah fantastic. So what should we say? Time, time for the mac I, th I think we're i think we're uh, we're on good time to uh, to run into drum number two rich if you don't mind taking us away with the mac yeah, yeah. I'll, um, I'll pull myself one here where we can see on the screen here. So dram or whiskey number two is the Mac. There we go. Just pull myself one there. I can't multitask very well, Mick, as you know, so I'll just pull that down. It's difficult to turn around and get bottles and store and talk <laughs> at the same time, Rich. So, um, so Mac, uh, Mac, 40% uh, ABV. Um, cask recipe for this um, and cask recipe. By that I mean, you know, the, the types of casks and their previous contents and things that have, that have gone into to making the whiskey up. Um, Mick, you went through the the Brooks whiskey, and there's you know four or five different types of casks um, have gone into that, you know, with our, our whiskey and as well as different sizes and things as well. Whereas this is uh, is exclusively matured in American oak casks. So <clears throat> you hear uh, anyone that that you know? I think we've had a few people at least. It's their first uh, tasting might not be their first time drinking whiskey, but first tasting perhaps. So, so if you ever hear uh, American oak, um, that will mean um, that it, it's the first time any sort of liquid has gone into that cask. So virgin uh, American oak. Um, if you hear ex bourbon, as Mickey mentioned earlier for the Brooks whiskey, that means bourbon was in it before that puts the flavors into that wood. You get these bourbon sweetness, caramels, vanillas go into the wood. Bourbon comes out. The cask comes over to Sweden. We put our whiskey in it, and then uh, you can that the previous contents impart a little bit of influence uh, into it. Same as uh, ex Oloroso sherry casks, Pedro Jimenez, um, and whatever it might be. Uh, with this though, very simple, just one type of cask, and that's American oak. Um, American oak is is filled with um, uh, vanillins and and uh, properties that give sort of caramel flavours to it, which is why bourbon tastes um, often the way it does. Um, so with this. Uh, I find this is a bit the the mouthfeel to this, Mick. I don't know about you. I don't think we've discussed this before. That this has got a, is a bit more round yeah. in the yeah. in the mouth um, to me, um, and definitely orchard fruits uh, again coming through. But with me on this one, it's um, it's you know caramelized pear maybe rather than sort of fresh pear, as in, yeah. you know, in the Brooks whiskey was like that. Um, so anyone that's having a, a, a nose of it or, or move to the palate, you know, that's joining us from home, please uh, please comment. Let us know. Um, you know what, what you can find in it and something that Mick and I always say um, when we're doing these tastings is if you think you can find something and you can put a name to it it is there whether yep. you can see anybody else saying it in the comments or you, you're, you're in a room with somebody when we can all do it again uh, and uh, nobody's saying this this one note that uh, that you can find um, because you can find it it is there um, it's all so subjective and, and all down to personal taste and, and memory and, and the way that you know all of our our brains work so um, there is, there's, there's definitely no wrong answers there whatsoever. Um, Mick, nose, nose rise for you. What do you, what do you pick up? Nose on this, Rich. Again, you know, like the the, the stewed pears, like a like a like a pear to tang sort of thing. Do you know what I mean? With the caramel in the pears, that sort of thing. Like you know, um, yeah. Uh, obviously, as people, hopefully, some of our returning guests, but for to people that are new here, uh, I'm absolutely rubbish. Uh, at taste and notes and telling you exactly what I can get. Exactly, you'll get some things that are quite blunt, uh, but generally I'll go, "Hmm, that smells. That smells really quite nice. I'd like to try a taste of that." Then I'll taste it. Hmm. Yeah, I really enjoyed the taste of that. Um, I'd like to drink some more of that, please, or I'd like to buy a bottle. That's mm. the general extent of my taste and notes, really. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it's great that some people can really go into great lengths and depths and stuff like that of things to notice. And that's fantastic. My palate isn't as sophisticated or as tuned in as that, believe it or not. Um, 
what I'd like to do is just go, yeah, I like the smell of that. That smells really, really nice. I'd like to smell that a little bit. There's some whiskies that I've had where I can just spend hours just smelling them, you know, before I even got around to trying them. You know, they just smell so good. And you go, yeah, I need to get into this. And then you taste it and go, oh, this is phenomenal. Do you know what I mean? And that's all you really need. Yeah, by all means, analyze it and try and find uh, memories and stuff like that in your drums. Please do, by all means. Happy with that, Mandy. Thank you. Uh, but if you can't, don't think that you're broken in some way because you're not. Okay? Uh, yes. Eastern notes are very, very personal, very, very subjective. Well, you can, you can, you can, um, you, you can, you can train. So it, it's some people have a natural ability to be able to do it and to, you know, to discern a dozen different things from the nose, in, you know, with with one sniff of a of a glass. But and uh, and others, I think you and I are in this category of have to sort of work quite hard to uh, to uh, to put words to things um, often yep. enough. But I wouldn't, you know, I don't want to put ourselves down too much, Mick, because we had to do those, you know, pre-record those tasting notes for the. the well, for the, the other day and we did we did we know we did we did we did okay I, I'd, I'd like to think but there is um uh th there is a way of of learning it or approaching things so if nothing's jumping out of the glass at you immediately and you can say because we've seen some people in the comments here saying you know they agree about caramels and pear drops and things um you, you can you can start with a, a broad a, a broad um description so if yeah. you put your you know you, you bring bring the bring the glass to your nose i might just do it now um I would uh, I would advise uh, well one tip anyway you know do it however you please but um, if you tilt your glass 45 degree angle um, and try and nose towards the bottom half of it for the the heavier um, richer notes and if you know for the more delicate ones approach the top of the glass here reason that there's a difference is all those heavy ethanols and things trying to escape from the whiskey roll out the bottom of the glass here whereas the lighter um, less well less 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 Bernie, well, we might have, for want of a better term, um, notes come out from the top. So if you nose it up here, and, and don't put your nose right in the glass, like a, a, you might with a, a glass of wine, um, you know, a, approach it from a, a bit of a distance and come back and forth to it. If you think you can find something that um, I said about starting broad, if you can start broad and say, well, there's some sweetness there. There's, there's, got a, a, there's some sweetness to this nose. You can then ask yourself, um, is, it, uh, is it a fruity sweetness? Or is it, you know, a more of a confectionery type sweetness? You know, so is it is it is it caramel or is it fruit as a sweet? And then you can narrow down. So if you say, right, okay, this is more fruity than it is, you know, um, sugary sweet. You can then drill down further and, and try and say, well, okay, well, what type of fruits might it be? And then go down that way. Um, it, equally true for for some of the darker, heavier things as well. So not just uh, on the sweet side, but um, if you, you can get spices, you can sort of start with this is a spicy dram. And then say what type of spice is it, and then move on your way down there. So that's just one sort of one one semi pro tip, um, I would say. Um, but yeah, shall I move in perhaps to a little bit of history about Mac while we've got the comments coming in? Yeah, yeah. So um, we mentioned the Gravity Distillery where we started producing in uh, twenty well 2011, 2012 opened up, started producing. Um, here we have a picture of the the front. Um, it's 35 meters tall, seven floors up. There's a roof bar at the very top where you can see there's a, a balcony there. And um, starting the floor below that, and each subsequent floor on the way down is the next stage, uh, one after another, of the production process. So instead of having a, a whiskey distillery in a horizontal fashion, as you know, basically all of them are, um, you know, using energy and power and things from pumping one room, pumping things from one room to the next. Uh, we start at the top. We have two big grain silos on the back of the distillery that take the grain to the top and then each floor on the way down. So starting with you know, yeah, sieving and, and cleaning. Here we go. Um, then you've got um, milling and mashing below. Uh, then fermentation, where you're basically turning your um, your barley and, and water uh, into beer um, effectively, you know, minus the hops, of course. Uh, and then uh, distillation takes place, the floor below fermentation, which is where you take your beer, you put it into big, you know, basically kettles and um, and, and, and heat it so that, you know, all the, the vapours go up the top of the still, come down the line arm through the condenser. And, uh, and as Mickey described earlier, we can capture, we you know, ignore the first part and then capture the heart cut uh, in the middle. We use about 45 percent less energy in the gravity distillery than we did at the Brooks distillery which is like that that is just mind-boggling in terms of 
what a, what a drop, what an enormous drop in terms of energy consumption. Um, the, you know, the founders, when they started out, this is always something that they they wanted to to get to, something like this that would be, you know, our, our basically, you know, a forever home where um, where sustainability was always key. They even, um, Mick, something I've, you know, found out, that you and I have spoken about it a couple of times, but I like to bring it up, um, a mailing list in, in 1999 or 2000 when we put, you know, had a first mailing list um, yeah. created. Instead of posting things to, to everyone, as, you know, everybody was still doing back then, even though computers obviously did exist, um, they, they had an email only mailing list because yeah. even back then, even a, a new company who could have benefited from using, you know, paper mail outs to people and, and you know, get, get a larger audience more quickly, um, decided, no, actually, you know, uh, principle wise, we're going to stick and, and just do emails to people. Yeah. So um, there's all these little details as well that add up. So um, other other parts of the gravity, disorder, it's not just gravity from one floor to the next. Uh, we capture the heat that's created from various parts of the process that gets captured and recycled and used elsewhere in the distillery or just for heating the offices uh, as well. Uh, we have our own uh, small power plant just to the side of the distillery as well, um, which is fueled by bio pellets. So, you know, so even a, a, you know, a, a good sustainable um, uh, energy source as well coming from there. And, um, and the, the draft, uh, draft being for anyone who's not familiar with that word, um, the, the physical matter left, you know, from the barley once we've, uh, drained it of all its starches and, and sugars at the very early stage of the production process. Um, you've got this physical material left over in Scotland or in you know, just about anywhere in the world that, that makes any type of whiskey. That will usually go off to uh, to feed cows at local farms. Um, but we instead ship it to uh, a facility that, excuse me, turns it into uh, bio pellets and then sends it back to us so that we can then, you know, power the distillery with it as well. So it's not just gravity one floor to the next. There's all these different ways inside of the distillery that um, you know keep our, our carbon footprint down and um, you know and, and and energy at the same time. So, yeah, I think we're we're the only Mick, and we have to keep saying we believe you and I. We to believe, our knowledge, to our knowledge, listen yeah. to this footprint. To our knowledge, to, <laughs> to to our knowledge, we are the only um, gravity distillery in the world that's uh, that's currently producing. Uh, whiskey there is uh, and i think they've 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 broken ground and I th i'm not sure how yeah, you're just, i think it's just for their foundations okay yeah right so so foundations have started in uh, in leith uh, in edinburgh for a gravity distillery there as well which i think is a, a great if you're in an urban area um, and hopefully we see more of this over the coming decades you know more and more people looking at gravity distilleries um the urban area where you can you might only have a small amount of land to build a distillery but you want to have one in a city or a town Gravity Distillery is a great way to do it, which I think it's, uh, it's fantastic um, that they're doing it. There are a few distilleries uh, around. I believe Glen Anarchy is one, and um, I know there's one or two others that have, you know, uh, gravity involved, um, purposefully involved at one point or another in their distillery. But um, but we are, to our knowledge, currently, to our, to our knowledge, currently the only ones that have a purpose-built um, gravity distillery as well. So, yeah, and Mac... Uh, to tie Mac back into it, Mac is the first whiskey that's been um, uh, completely made at that distillery. So whereas whereas the other whiskies that we're trying this evening, um, you know, would have come from the the Brooks Distillery, our previous distillery, uh, Mac is the is the only one in the first the first that's been completely made uh, at the Gravity Distillery. And I say that's enough of a monologue from me, Mick. I'm going to have a sip of this whiskey and wet my whistle. To do that, while you do that, Rich, let's let's address some of the comments. So Robert gets pear drops on the nose. Fantastic! Coming I mean, up to keep us up. There's more to this one, which is which is a great comment, but it's quite strange that people think there's more to this one because there's a lot more cask makeup going on for Brooks than there is with Mac. So that that's quite interesting. I, I like that that people say that. And then we mentioned pear drops. Yeah, totally agree. The caramel and pear drops. Fantastic, Dave. Uh, smoother than the Brooks whiskey. Oh, there's a dreaded smooth word again. There's a lot of people in the industry that hate that word to be used as taste notes. But you know what? If you find it smooth, then you knock yourself out. That's what you use. Uh, yeah, well, I think, Nick, just, yeah. just, just, just to piggyback on what you were saying there, I think people that get upset with the word smooth being used need to calm down a little bit. Yeah. Um, smooth, um, uh, um, somebody will tell you, say, say soft instead of, instead of smooth. I say, say whatever you please. Um, if you think that, uh, that something is smooth and that's an experience you're having or, or something that, uh, that you're enjoying about something, Call it smooth. 
call it smooth. Don't worry about what these other people, um, you know, uh, um, I, don't, I don't want to be unkind or anything, but pretentious yeah, I mean, people might say, yeah. don't say this word or that. Say whatever you like. Yeah. I mean, in all fact, I mean, smooth isn't a taste. So it's not a tasting note. It's a feeling you get. So the smooth isn't a tasting note. It's just it goes down smoothly. So. Yeah. But that's still that's still, and I don't want to go off on another rant or anything now. But that's still part of the that's still part of the experience, and it's part of, you know a valid part um, of the experience as well. If, if especially if if the whiskies that you've you've been drinking up until the point you've tried something that you call smooth have been a bit you know and it's called a rough, you know, a, bit, yeah. a bit prickly on the back of the throat, and all of a sudden you find a whiskey that actually goes down smoothly. What else are you going to call it? You know, you're going to just all of us you know have to instinctively know to call it soft because somebody. In a, in a tweed jacket somewhere, I said you can't say smooth. I don't think so. Well, so fantastic. So Dave's used Dave's used tasting in his job for years. Sometimes it's just what you like. You don't have to complicate it. Yeah, absolutely spot on, Dave. Um, what is it? Uh, Bramley apples, maple syrup, coastal air, and tinned peach. Wow. Uh, a bit like the Aaron 2006 uh, G&M that you've been enjoying all week. Nice one, Stuart. Nice one. Mandy's very impressive. Mandy, hopefully your rabbit's talking back to you. I noticed earlier you said that you were explaining to the rabbit how it was moving. It wasn't interested. But hopefully the rabbit's talking back to you now. Um, so Kim thinks a lot of the whiskey flavour comes from the from, come from the barrels that it matures in. Yep, that's correct. Before it gets moved into cast to mature. Uh, when it first gets distilled, what does MacMira taste like? So you can actually buy uh, a product from MacMira.co.uk or some of our retailers around the country as well. We actually sell our new make at 46.1%. So at our, at our bottling strength, it's called Vithund, which means white dog. Um, so, yeah, so you can get that uh, from any of our retailers and especially at macmira.co.uk. Um, so from that, it's, um, it's you, you get the, the Macmira DNA. It's very, very fruity. Uh uh, and, but it's obviously spirit led because it's not got that cask influence. As you rightly said, Kim, you know, a, a good a good balance of the flavour comes from that. Uh, well, we, we try to you know not be too divisive amongst people, Dave. Do you know what I mean? We don't want to upset people. <laughs> Smoother than a really smooth thing, yeah. Rubber. <laughs> I'll take smooth. that. Smoother than a rubber ball on a dolphin's nose. <laughs> oh, that's not a bad one, mate. Mate, yeah. Very good. Um, I think what what uh, Kim's question. I, I I I enjoy a question like that as well because I think if um, not sure Kim, let us know if you've ever been on a, a whiskey distillery tour. You know, um, uh, you know Scotland. I think is a, a common one to uh, for people to have been on. And there, there's some places will tell you that you know anywhere from like seventy to eighty percent of a whiskey's flavour will come from the cask, and that's not exclusively true it is it um a lot a lot of whiskey flavor will come from the cask but it depends on um on 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 who you are what distillery you know you are where the whiskey is coming from um the ones that say 80 percent of their flavor comes from the cask it will be true but that's because you know they're using um let's say distillers yeast or, or certain barleys that are high yield so you can get lots of liquid and whiskey and alcohol out of these ingredients but there's not a lot of flavor in them so, you know, so they need the casks to be able to put most of the flavour into that whiskey. Not, And that is not a true like, across the board. That's just in, in some cases. So they go for yield over over flavour, whereas other distilleries and, you know, to say us in particular, will have really long fermentation times. We use a, a baker's um, yeast, a Swedish baker's yeast, which is a lot more slow acting than, um, than yeah. distillers yeast might be. Um, so we have to ferment things for longer. And while you're fermenting things for longer, and in, in when you get up to 80 to 90 hours or so of fermentation time, um, you get all sorts of fruits. So the orchard fruits, um, you know, that Mickey and I have mentioned as part of our spirit character, you know, and what it tastes like before it's been in the cask. A lot of those fruit flavours, in fact, you know, it almost exclusively come from that that fermentation time as well. So, yeah, I think to, to answer your question in a bit more succinctly, it really depends on uh, well, how much flavour you get from the cast depends on how you're making your whiskey, basically. So you can design it so that it's more or less. But um, a, a a very large proportion, no matter how you're making it, a large proportion will come from the cask. Yeah. So Mandy's first uh, first tasting was at Talisker. Uh, the, so so the new make uh, the new make was uh, was very strong. Yep. Yep. That, so was that, my, was... that was my um, that was my first ever distillery tour. Um, 
2016 so not too uh, long ago but uh yeah mandy that was um that that was that was my first ever place uh, a special place in my heart i've been there back uh sort of two or three times now, i think uh since and yeah that um that that their new make very strong i think i think what you're given there is 60 64 percent if i'm not mistaken i think because i can find um people filling their car shirt between sort of 60 and, and 64 yeah. Um, yeah but uh not not everyone but around about there so yeah very strong perfect Oof. right so i think that wraps up uh, that wraps up mac for us rich yeah yes mate that's um into the Bjork Sav mix. Into Bjork Sav, yeah. So before we head into Bjork Sav, we have a quick intro video. Connor, if you don't mind. How beautiful is that, though? I mean, that, that's a lovely video, that isn't it? I love that video. So. Guys, with, with, with Bjork Sav, we're, we're continuing our proud tradition of challenging the whiskey norms uh, and highlighting Swedish nature, the flavours and craftsmanship. Uh, so, But in keeping with this approach, uh, this year's spring edition, which we're just about to tuck into, uh, is called Bjork Sav, which means birch sap. Uh, it's a whiskey that provides a clear sign of spring, uh, and just like the opening of birch buds, uh, as you saw at the in that video there. Um, so like all our seasonal releases, Bjork Sav is, is a limited edition single malt, uh, so about 15,000 bottles, um, just to give you a rough idea, uh, yeah, about 15,000 bottles, but that's to go globally. Um, so, but, you know, um, we release two new limited ed edition seasonals uh, every year, uh, like Rich said earlier, spring, summer, and autumn, winter. Uh, this is our spring, summer for this year. Um, so they're, they're, you know, they're like Rich said, you know, they're adapted to the prevailing season's flavors. Uh, this has become a great success and tradition over the past sixteen years. Uh, the seasonal additions have helped uh, help the distillery gain a, a positive international reputation. It's really made us stand out. Uh, so with the whiskey's final maturation and casks saturated with flavors that reflect Swedish nature, uh, the seasonal range makes a strong contribution. Uh, to Macmillan's innovation and leadership in the new world whiskey category, uh, which has seen us take away some good awards over the years, you know, uh, at the IWSC, uh, the Whiskey Magazine Awards, and all, and all those really, really thought of places. Um, so yeah, so but yeah, so in this year's spring edition, um, we've once again collaborated with, with our good friends, the Swedish artisan winery uh, Glitterstam. Uh, Glittertan Vim, actually. Uh, so like us, Glittertan uh, used exceptional crafting skills, uh, showing consideration and respect for nature and not only use natural ingredients, uh, and only use natural ingredients, uh, should I say. So the, the fresh, delicately sweet uh, Bjork's, uh, Bjork wine, or birch sap wine, uh, has resulted in a uniquely crafted Swedish whiskey that's ready to join the world of whiskey. Um, we've done something quite good this year and, and i'll talk about that in a second but uh on our website uh uh you'll find uh, a product sheet on all of our bottlings um from the from this year going forward so from from bjorks and going forward we will put in percentages of each cask type uh, onto the sheet you know for maximum transparency we don't really want to hide anything uh so for this release that we're having now uh, we're taking whiskey, Asian ex bourbon casks, and that makes up about 30% of the total recipe. Uh, whiskey aged in uh, Oloroso casks, which makes up about 24% of the total recipe. Whiskey finished in the uh, whiskey finished in the Birch Hat wine season casks that we spoke about just now makes up 20% of the total recipe. Uh, whiskey aged in other types of season casks, so some other berry wines and cherry wine casks, and there's some others at play there as well, uh, make up 18% of the recipe. And whiskey aged in casks of Swedish oak uh, makes up 8%. So if any, anybody good at maths out there, um, then that roughly comes up to about 100%, right? something like that. Oh, uh, I, I, I wasn't... Um... I wasn't adding up, but I hope it does because uh, you know it's it's there now on paper. So uh, fingers crossed, for the match yeah. check out. So guys, as you do this, take a sip without water, 
but also we have found that this does take just a wee drop of water really quite well to open it up that little bit more. Um, and when I say a wee drop, I mean literally mean like a teardrop of water. Uh, I quite enjoy this uh, out of the fridge. But I, I, um, I first tried this, Mick. It arrived when uh, you and I and the rest of the team were having our uh, our, uh, our our Zoom training on this on this whiskey. And uh, mine mine arrived a little late, and it arrived the morning of, and we were there at, at nine thirty a.m. a few weeks ago, and it arrived, and because it was straight off the van, it was it you know it was cold, it had been you no know, yeah, yeah. storage overnight, so much chill, and um oh, yeah, um a little a little cold, not too chilled or anything, but um I I thought it was absolutely magic. I think um, at room temperature for me, this is this is one of the best um, seasonals that, that's come out at least you know whilst we've been here. But yeah, I, I agree. A, a drop or a splash of water for this, depending on how much you've got uh, in your glass, I think uh, yeah, goes down a tree. I've seen um, Katie said you know uh, um, I found some sharpness at the end, you know, on the finish. Yeah. So I, I'd um, I'd recommend Katie if you could if you've got a way of being able to put a, you know a, a, a teeny amount of water into it, um, just see, see um, and pop some in and, um, and and see what happens for you. Uh, but yeah, toffee apples on the finish. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Kevin, as well. Um, very soft, using that good word there. Um, yeah, very much. There, 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 so there's there's Katie's comment as well. But yeah, yeah anyone that yeah. might find a little bit of uh, of sharpness on this whiskey or any whiskey you try in any tasting, add a drop of water to it. Don't just um, don't think oh it's a bit too sharp for me. Add a drop of water and it will um, it, it it can change change the whole game. Oh. Uh yeah, brilliant. No, not a problem. Not a problem at all, Kim. Uh, yeah. We did a, a virtual distillery tour before with Balveni. Before that, I didn't really know how much gets thrown away in the distillation process or that the original spirit is clear. Yeah. 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 Uh, not a lot gets thrown away, in all fairness, even in other more traditional distilleries. Um, you know, the, the, the draft tends to go for cattle feed or bio, or biomass burner uh, fuel. Um, and most of the time, uh, and a lot of the a lot of the spent leaves, the liquid and stuff like that goes as like fertilizer for for farmers and things. So, not really, not anything. If if much get does get actually thrown away from from a lot of distilleries. Mm. That um, it was quite a revelation for me, though. I think I'd uh, I have to agree with Kim there when I found out that that whiskey when it first comes off of the still is yeah. completely colourless. Is you know gin vodka looking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we spoke earlier about, you know, uh, um, um, flavours coming from the cask into the whiskey. Um, it's, it, it's cask give whiskey their colour. That's where that's where you get um, uh, any colour in, in whiskey. Um, you are allowed to use um, a small amount of E150 um, caramel colouring. Um, um, lots of people do it. I think we've only got one one whiskey in our active range now that we have. Everything else is, is natural colour. Um, across the board and and certain whiskies that you find you know that are really really dark they'll come from really active casks something that might be what we would refer to as a, a first fill i spoke earlier about virgin oak this and that uh, a first fill cask would be um uh, if it's a first fill ex oloroso sherry cask for example you get lots of color from um, first means oloroso sherry was in it before this is the first time whiskey has gone into it to mature. So with that, you'll just draw loads of colour and flavours from that that um, that sherry coming through as well. So for, yeah. for anybody for anybody interested, the official taste of notes, as written by Angela, for this on the nose, uh, it's floral and fruity with a light spiciness. We get vanilla fudge, sandalwood, cedar, and toasted bread. Uh, floral and slightly waxy notes of the birch sap wine, round and fruity notes of cherry, raisins, apple, pear, and lemon. See, already you can tell that me and Richard did not write these. <laughs> uh, and then on the palate, uh, a fresh and fruity spiciness with like minerals and herbs together with vanilla fudge, raisins, apple, uh, ripe pears, and lemon. Light spices of vanilla, toasted oak, floral, honey. Sandalwood, cedar, anise, white pepper, and ginger. Round oak and vanilla spices together with a slightly oily texture. And then on the on the finish, it's light spicy notes in harmony with toasted oak and dried fruit. So as you can tell, you know there's quite a bit going on in the cask makeup, and that's quite reflective um, in in those tasting notes. Really, 
you know what I mean? You have to take a few breaths when reading them out uh, because, you know, uh, there is quite a lot going on with this uh, and it will forever change, so a drop of water. And I found, so I, I um, the, the Hit Flask Whiskey Club uh, run, were running, a we, uh, are running currently, I think still it's ongoing, um, uh, an ice cream, uh, a whiskey, uh, a whiskey ice cream float uh, challenge. So you, you, you make a whiskey ice cream float. So all you need is a whiskey, some soda, whether that be like a, a, a cola or, or whatever, any a fizzy juice, basically, uh, and some ice cream. Um, and honestly, it's been great. I made one with Birchap wine, uh, the, 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 the Bjork Sav. Uh, and I just added some, um, just some plain, uh, some cream soda. Uh, just normal cream soda that you'd associate with a, with a, with an ice cream float. But I did a cream soda, so uh, a double of the uh, Bjorks of uh, a can of um, the so the the, uh, the cream soda over just some plain vanilla ice cream. Oh, and I put um, a, a, a caramel biscuit in the top. It was fantastic. It was really really good. So. Yeah, uh, and I didn't really lose a lot of the taste of the whiskey either. Just some of the sweeter flavours um, were enhanced, uh, and it was lovely. So don't be scared to um, to play around with it, guys. Uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, it's it's really really good. Hmm. Yeah, so this is this is spring in a glass for me, Mick. This yeah. one, just you know, yeah, fresh, um, lots of uh, sweetness to it, but then like a. Uh, there's, there's there's those you know warm warm spices coming through. You said about um, the seasonals are uh, there to sort of showcase our, our spirit character in uh, in different ways. <laughs> um, showcase our, our, our spirit character in, in different ways and sort of a, a, attuned to whichever season they they might be released with. And this to me is um, this feels very much like spring. If anyone um, joining us tonight, I know that, I know for a fact there's, there's at least a few, but people that have tried um, yacked liquor. Uh, which was our autumn release from last year. So one of the two seasonals we had out last year. That, for me, was autumn in a glass as well. Um, it, it was, you know, the, how Angela does it and gets it just, it seems to be very well fitted and suited. Yeah. Uh, time, I have to say, yeah, hats off to yeah. it. Yeah. I, like, I like Kevin's comment there, mate. All ingredients have a quality street toffee coin, but he, he looked it up to get that note. So brilliant. Well, well done, Kevin. Love it. Uh, Kevin Vaughan, this is a great move of ice. Uh, an ice stone in there, okay. Not added any water, but it tastes amazing cold. Yeah, definitely tasting the wine. Brilliant. I, I, uh, I tend to just bring mine out of the fridge, put a dram in like an hour or two before I'm, uh, I'm, I'm bringing it out of the fridge. Uh, that, 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 yeah, no, you're not, you're not wrong there, Kev. It was a bit like that, and it's like one of those you can only have maybe like one of. Uh, but it was definitely worth it for sure. Uh, Adam Smith really enjoying this one and getting the honey on toast. Nice. Nice, I like that. Ah, oh, bless you. Thank you very much, Kim. So mixed cocktail recipes are awesome. Your your cocktail recipe. I don't want to take anything away from you, Mick, at all, because because they are. But, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm about to a little bit, I suppose, because your your cocktail recipes are just are other people's recipes where you you you, you change an ingredient to uh, that you but, but but you do it because you think that this would be you know you you'd like to see what it's exactly. like. So it it still it still it does still count. It's just my version of. <laughs> my version of well on the Fridays me. Fridays in I did my version or a Swedish version of the rusty nail so a rusty nail two parts scotch whiskey one part dram um or like uh, I think you have to be dram for a rusty nail I'm not hundred percent sure but so I did um, two parts svetskaruk and one part uh, Macmira B which is our honey liqueur that we do um, for um, Rostig Spick, which is Rusty Nail, but in Swedish. So, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to change the world and come up revolution or anything, do you know what I mean? But, no. yeah, I like to, like to play around with a few things on some, some well-known, tried and tested uh, combinations and put our own spin on it, Rich. I think I think it's good that you do it. I think I'd encourage anyone at home to uh, to experiment and, and play around with it as well. As you were talking about a, a moment ago, and say, you know, because all you have to do is change one one ingredient, and you, it's, it's mix martini or mix old fashioned. All of a sudden, yeah, yeah you can just exactly. make, make ownership yep. of it. Yeah, and that's all everyone else did before me anyway. Was they so, took some other like 
true, you know, two parts a gin, one part a whiskey, and you know what I mean, and it got called, uh, you know, a something, and you go, all right, cool, I'll, well, I'll just make that gin my own particular brand of gin, and I'll make that the whiskey part of it my own particular brand, of, and and I'll just, I'll just, you know, rename it to start, and you go, bang, there you go, that's that's that. Um, so it's all I did with the Macatini rich, really, wasn't it? You know, we, we took uh, we, we took the Vespa recipe, so the you know the Vespa Martini, uh, made famous by James Bond, obviously, uh, where it was like three parts gin, one part uh, sorry, three parts vodka, one part gin, uh, one part Kina uh, Kina uh, Lillet. Uh, I, I just changed the uh, the the recipe on that really. So I did three parts of our lab gin, one part of the Grand Té. Uh, uh, I put in some Lillet Blanc because they don't make Kina Lillet anymore, Lillet Blanc and for, to get a bit of bitterness in there just a, a drop of Angostura bitters shaken over the ice like you do get, get my hippie hippie shake on and uh, then just into a nice um, into a nice champagne coupe and it was just it was lovely mm. it was really sounds, nice sounds magic, I'll, um, one of these days I'll, I'll, I'll very strong my though, be careful, very very strong um <laughs> he's no, not, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> he's got he's got thick skin. Yeah, he's all right. Uh, Tom, no. Uh, Mac Mira B is similar to other well-known um, whiskey-based honey liqueurs, uh, like I mentioned, Drum Beauty. So it's along those sort of lines. Uh, we did um, Svensk Svensk Vinter. Yeah, uh, which we no longer make. So if there's still some out in the wild, you might be able to get it. That was more like the mead, Stuart. I, I think if you've seen anything like that, then um, it was Svent Kvinter that we did. That was more like the mead. Cool, Mick. Let's do dram number four. I think we should, Rich. I think we should. Sir. So, would you like to take us away with um, probably our flagship malt, Rich? Uh, Svent, yeah. Svent, yeah. Svent, yeah. So. Uh... We had uh, Moa uh, Nielsen, aka uh, Swedish Whiskey Girl. If anyone's seen her on uh, on, on Instagram or, or Facebook um, and Twitter, obviously, uh, she she came along a little while ago and, and did a special show with us that you can find um, on our, our YouTube channel somewhere in the in the, the previous videos where uh, she came and schooled us on how to pronounce um, the whiskeys in our range because we've been struggling for so long to pronounce uh, some it's of them. Yeah. Um, and and Svensk Ek, as I thought it was called, you know, I thought that was the easiest one there, and uh, we'd had that nailed down for the first six months of working here. But uh, Mara came along and very kindly helped us, and uh, and told us actually it's uh, Iak, uh, or close enough uh, to it. So Svensk Ek, which means uh, Svensk Swedish Ek um, oak, so Swedish oak. Um, this is, I think, uh, we will probably start seeing some comments come in about this being a, a step up in terms of um, robustness, perhaps, um, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, gen general sort of a size in experience, whereas the others have been um, the, the delicate or relatively delicate in their, their profile. This is a big meaty dram. Um, the reason for that is the Swedish oak influences in there. So um, the casks that have gone into making this, um, all of the whiskey that's gone into this began its life maturing in ex bourbon casks. Uh, and then for the final 18 months uh, of that whiskey's life, 10%, uh, so a very small amount of that whiskey was taken from that um, ex bourbon casks or those ex bourbon casks and put into Swedish oak casks. Um, Swedish oak, uh, as, as much of you know, European oak uh, in general, far higher in, in tannins. Um, and, uh, and and far lower levels of, of lingons and, and wood sugars that you would find in American oak. So whereas the Mac that we had at the beginning, you know, l American oak, lots of vanillas, lots of caramels in there. Um, this is, is is the opposite. We can see on, on the left, European oak is far more or, or s grows far more slowly than American oak, yet um, tighter grain, basically, because of that. And lots more uh, uh, access for um, the, the liquid basically to get in and out of that wood so you can um, mature things rather fast uh, in European oak. Swedish oak is European oak and and then some just because of how you know even colder obviously in Sweden um, it grows even more slowly than the oak would grow uh, in France. Um, Swedish oak's got a bit of a, a, a story but I think I'll, I'll ask people's comments to come through uh, and let us know what you're thinking um, about it. I've seen that some have started coming through. Can we just say goodnight to Kevin Blair? 
a, a, a good regular of ours uh, and a contributor to, to Mac Mirror stuff. Good night, Kev. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Cheers, Kevin. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so interesting to see what, what people uh, think of it. But for me, this is uh, Swedish Oak, the influence that I think Swedish Oak has and how I usually describe it, and especially after Mick, you and I have tried a number of, uh, of single cask whiskies of ours that have only been in Swedish Oak and nothing else. For me, that spirit character that we keep talking about, because it is key, because, you know, you need to have some consistency throughout the range so that you know you're being a mirror, would be um, fruits, as I said, fruity, spicy, and a bit of herbaceous, um, a, a herbaceous element to it. But those fruits, that fresh apple, pear, uh, banana even, for me, this, the Swedish oak has, I describe like a cooking effect on those fruits. So you can still find them in here, especially when you get to the palate and the finish. You can still find them in there, but um, all of a sudden it's it's like apple pie to me, you know, baked apple and, and uh, cinnamon spices in there, whereas that cinnamon wasn't present before in the other ones that we've had. Um, a caramelized pear again. Um, and you know, and and cooked banana. That's what you know. That sort of browned cooked banana, baked banana. Um, so the, the those those uh, elements of our, our spirit character are still there, but they've been to me, you know, cooked by that Swedish oak. What do you think about that, Mick? Or uh, or what your what's yeah, your take? No, absolutely, absolutely spot on, Rich. Really, because you know, one of the big takeaways I get from Swedish oak is the white pepper on the finish. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's one of my one of my biggest things. But you're hundred percent right there. I think anyway, uh, and looking at it, lots of people will agree as well that um, yeah, that it has, it has got that 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 proper seasoning cooking effect uh, on on the orchard fruits, Rich. You know what I mean? So it's like we're on it. We're into the you know the the apple pie, the pear to tan a bit a bit more on this one, like you know. Uh, so what Ma Mandy and Robert think there's a bit of eucalyptus in here? Yeah, so that's what you get, guys. Definitely without questionable doubt. Um, one of Dave Pennington's favourites, brilliant. Uh, yeah, Mandy's just coming with the tart to tan again. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, well, nice one, Dave. Yeah, full on delicious. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, brilliant. Mm. So while we see, um, well, while we have a few more uh, uh, comments uh, roll in, I mentioned, um, you know, there's there's a, an interesting story about Swedish shows. So I might just launch uh, launch into it because it's one, it's one of the it's an unintended pun there, though, isn't it, Rich? Isn't it? With the launch, yeah, launch. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, to, to us, we recognise that as a pun. What, what, what do you do with ships? <laughs> Sorry, just my crap humour, guys. Apologies. No, no. Let us uh, give give Mickey's joke a, a score out of ten, perhaps in the comments, and, and be yeah, kind. Please to don't. Me. Please don't. Do Everything's sort of a minus, Rich. I mean. Uh, well, well, Swedish oaks. I mean, you know, um, oak, oak has, has, has been. Um, in present in Sweden, in, in southern Sweden for, you know, for just about as long as it has been anywhere else uh, in Europe. Obviously, the further north you go in Sweden, the less you're going to see of it until you don't see really any at all because it's just not, you know, suited to those climates. But um, in in 1830, it will take a, a year or two, um, you know, the, the Swedish rulers decided that there, there wasn't enough oak in Sweden to um, to build ships for for. Um, building, you know, or creating empire for trade, commerce around the world. They needed oak to be able to build ships, and they just they didn't have enough. So uh, they they set about an enormous project of uh, of planting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of oak trees. And they needed to find somewhere good uh, to go and do it, somewhere suitable to go and do it. And they found at uh, the island of Visinsjur, um, which is a, a, in a lake called Lake Vatern, which is about uh, well, that was how I pronounce it at least, about an hour south of Stockholm. Um, an island where, where kings have lived over the years and uh, and all sorts of, of, of uh, fancy Swedish folk, let's say. Um, what we can see here, some of the, the trees here don't look like oak trees to us, uh, to anyone, um, any resident Brits looking at these trees. You wouldn't think that was an oak, but uh, they are, in fact, uh, oak trees. And I'll, uh, I'll lead on to telling you why they're so straight uh, and tall. Um, but in, in 1830, they set about planting lots of trees, planting lots of oak trees in particular, um, to to build, you know, generations down the line. They knew that it's going to be 150 to 180 years before any of those trees were ready to be harvested and used. So like any good states person would do, I think I've said before to you, Mick, you know, that you know, you plan that far into the future. I think it's yeah. um, a prudent move. However, yeah, however, 30 years after planting hundreds of thousands of trees to be used to make ships, um, 
the first ironclad vessels began sailing the seas. I think the French had the first, and then there were two in the American Civil War in, uh, you know, between uh, 1860 and 1865. So, you know, 30, 35 years after they started planting all these trees, the, the technology basically had, had begun to become um, obsolete. And, you know, so what that, what that means is we're left with all of these trees now, which uh, are uh, happen to be perfect for making things like furniture or oak casks because they're so the Swedish oak trees and, and these ones in particular on Vicentia are so tall and straight they're perfect for it and they were engineered to grow that way it's not by mistake it's not just a, a certain type of oak that grows that way they did that by planting rows of them and in between those rows of oak trees they planted different types of trees so birch elm um and you know i'm sure there are, there are a few others in the mix um as well but they planted them in the middle to encourage those oak trees to grow straight and tall so that they could get the light you know above those other trees that were there um so yeah so they trained them basically to to grow in that way and what that means is it's perfect for making oak casks because you need tall straight trees with no branches you don't have these knots which are you know awful for when you're trying to make a, a watertight vessel or for create crafting any type of, of wooden um structure or, or thing really so so yeah so that's so that's the story of, of swedish oak so you know 180 years after they were planted 150 years a uh, a memo went to the the swedish navy to say we've got your trees ready um you know <laughs> do you want to do you want to make some ships out of them to which they replied no thanks we've been making ships out of steel for the better part of a century hmm. nice Richard. just to touch upon that the first french warship that was ironclad uh was um La Glore, G L O I R E. My French is worse than my Swedish. Uh, you, that's, you, that's, you googled that, or is that in the comments? Yeah, I did a quick one because <laughs> there, there, there is a warship uh, as part of the historic naval dockyard in Portsmouth called HMS Warrior, and that was the British. Uh, that was the British um, comeback, as it were, against uh, against the French. Uh, so HMS Warrior was the first uh, British warship. To be ironclad, I knew that because obviously uh, being ex Navy, and when I lived in Gosport, sitting across the Portsmouth every morning to go to, to go to and from work, that's the first thing you see uh, is 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 HMS Warrior on the on the waterfront there. Uh, mm -hmm. so, yeah, so I just I, I, when you were talking, I thought, oh, I've got a minute. Well, let's let me have a quick look at that a second. Uh, but yeah, we'll have to write that one down, mate, because uh, mm -hmm. I'm, 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 I think would be quite important as well. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have another show about it, but but yeah, I think that's um. Uh, that that to me, I've just I just always thought a, a, a that you know an interesting story where you know where where do these the, the oak trees uh, begin and you know that then end up being made into cars, but also yeah. the fact that they engineered them to grow the way that they did. I think it was yeah. you know um, it, yeah, quite impressive. Um, and when and and to take things even further, so the the cars that have been used with this, you know, the the small amount of, of Swedish oak cars that have been used uh, with this expression, it takes it takes a few years after felling the tree. It's, it's another it's another couple of years uh, at least until you can actually make a cask out of that wood because um, Swedish oak trees are so filled with um, you know resins and, and tannins and sort of bitter properties that um, you have to wait a long time for those to leave the wood. So quite often you will find um, places in America that make casks will kiln dry their oak. And to do that, you know, because you need dry oak to be able to make a cask out of. But when you kiln dry something, you do it quickly. You trap everything inside. Yep. So with Swedish oak, if you were to do yeah, that, right. when you do your steak, uh, yeah, you but you wouldn't, you just wouldn't be able to drink it. You wouldn't be, you know, it would be one percent of this might be Swedish oak uh, at most because it would just be too much. Um, so yeah, so they're left outside to air dry for two years rather than being kiln dried in a matter of hours. Um, or day or so they're, they're air dried for, for two years so that's you know there's even uh, so much time and 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 uh, different stages of the process going into making it and you threw me off a bit there what have we seen mick sorry mate so um so dave pennington was was, was saying that uh, any notes uh, and taste of baked pudding is good right uh, and kevin kevin's answer that was to be fair dave any taste that you personally like is great he's not dave, uh, kevin's not a pudding person but i know what you mean and he loves this fence yet yeah, nice Nice, like it. Okay, so, I, honestly, guys, thank you very much so much for this interaction you're having with us this evening. It makes a world of difference, and it helps my, me and Rich uh, be able to, to to pitch to you in a proper manner and, and engage with you as well. So please do keep this coming. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you. 
we've had some great engagement it makes it um it, rather than just mick and i who, who do a lot of these tastings together just you know us talking back and forth it's very good to have people in there and as mick said you know taylor we can read the room a little bit and see who we've got in and uh, and what sort of things might be interesting yeah. to uh, to talk about um if, if anyone's got any any birthday shout outs um you know ch ch chuck them in the comments as well we'll uh, we'll put your name up on screen and say yeah, happy we'll birthday we'll see, happy before we disappear yeah any any big announcements that um that we might have let us know yeah Oh, here we go. Look, Stuart's, Stuart's been on the uh, Stuart's been on the Google as well. Look, the, the French ironclad Glor was for, was the first ocean going ironclad. Nice, like it, like it. So Glor, Glor, we're sticking with Glor. Yeah, I, I, I will put that in my uh, Google Translate later, Rich, and let it speak to me and find out how, how to pronounce that properly. Uh, <laughs> oh, brilliant! Lovely to hear, Katie. Thank you very much. Uh, Ian, really enjoying it. Uh, just raising this final glass to your brother Neil, uh, who is uh, on this tonight too. Good evening, Neil. Uh, he brought him the taste and set as a little birthday gift. Oh, brilliant! Nice one. Well, welcome, yeah. gentlemen. Uh, happy uh, love birthday, yeah. Ian. Uh, uh, happy birthday. Um, happy birthday, Neil. Yeah. Oh, Gina, your birthday next week. Happy birthday! For we don't have a show at all next week, Gina. Oh, so we can't say. So we'll say happy birthday now, Gina. Happy fiftieth for next week, love. Uh, second lockdown birthday. Oh no! Uh, happy second lockdown birthday, Michael. Oh, sucks, dude. Uh, loving the military. <laughs> ah, brilliant. Happy with that. Thanks, Kev. Uh, thanks for the birthday activity while we're still inside. Our pleasure. Honestly, yeah. it 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 gives us an avenue to to not just be like cooped up in the house with nothing to do as well. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, it's just over a year we've been going at this, and uh, yeah, loving it. Yeah, well, ha happy bir happy birthday to everybody there who's uh, who's, who's commented and, and 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 said something. And yeah, we're we're great. Any any bit of interaction or uh, or good news and birthdays and things, it definitely uh, it, it lifts our spirits. Mix. We, we I think we're the first oh, distillery to do virtual tastings in the UK when lockdown started last year. So we've that we we've know done of, Rich. Uh, that we know of. Yeah, well, that we know of. But I think I think that is we were we uh, we were the first. Uh, I, I think. I'm pretty sure it's a solid thing, but we have to put in our. We have to put in our small print, Rich. Do you know what I mean? Yes, that we're yeah. aware of. Two Let's other chuck that in. <laughs> <laughs> if Connor could put a little banner going across the bottom now, yeah, yeah. any time we make a claim like that, he um he, he can pop one in there. So um, I see you pouring. I see you pouring the Spence Rook mix. Should we move move into just, the just in anticipation, Rich. Just in anticipation. Let's do it. Yeah. I, th I thought I'd pour it while you were talking, so I wasn't trying to talk and pour at the same time. <laughs> we look after each other. Yes. I won't let you multitask, mate. If we can help, appreciate that. So, guys, our our, our last dram for the evening, uh, unfortunately, uh, this is Svensk Guruk or Swedish smoke. That will become apparent in a second when you put it up to your nose for a nose in. It's forty six point one ABV, uh, and it's our smoky recipe. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Now. If you're not a peat fan, if you've tried uh, other, other whiskies that have been peated before and you go, oh, I don't like that, I'm not going to try that, please give it a chance. It is a really good entry into the world of peated whiskey. It's not a big punch in the face, and I'll explain why uh, in a second. Sorry. But Sorry, Mick, I didn't mean I didn't mean to distract you then, but but um, I just I saw it. Really <laughs> <different again. laughs> David, fantastic. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Have a good time. Yeah, I, I will say. I'll say um, uh, to David uh, and, and anybody that might join us again in, in the future and things. You you may well see Mick and I just steal that joke and use it as our own. Oh, hundred percent. And I should before, Mick, before, before, but before, <laughs> before we move too too far into into the French Rook, um, we've actually forgotten about a birthday shout out. Someone in our our team who might be running the show and driving. Yeah, we things. did. Yeah, we did. So, uh, so Connor, who is uh, who's the person responsible for for highlighting comments tonight and putting pictures up when they're meant to be and doing a, a grand old job, especially considering that yesterday was his birthday and uh, we know he had a rather lively one. And he's, so, and he's still awake at this time, yeah. so it's good. <laughs> and he's still, we know he's still awake because uh, we see the fact that comments are still coming up on screen. We know he's still with us. So, happy birthday, Connor, and uh, thanks for doing such such a, a marvelous job for us as well this evening. Yeah, cheers. Yeah, so spent Let's get anyway, it. That's the business. We've done all that sentimental crap now, Rich. Right. So, uh, guys, so um, 
Yeah, so the casks that go into our smoky recipe, yeah, uh, are quite small. Uh, so we only use um, 30, 100, and 128 litre casks. Uh, they, they come from uh, Swedish oak, um, American oak, and uh, ex-bourbon casks that were saturated with Oloroso. Uh, and all of those casks have had our, um, our rook recipe going into it. Um, so uh, what do I mean by that? So how does our peating process work? So we've got, you know, we said at the beginning, we try and stick to, well, we do, not try to, we actually do stick to 100% Swedishness. And that happens in our peating process as well. So we take our, we take our uh, peat from a, a, a bog uh, about, what is it, about 50, meet, 50 miles away, Rich? So it's yeah. quite local uh, in, in that regard. And we only take the very top layer. So Rich, what's that called? The, the white layer, isn't it? White, so yeah, white, white, white peat. It's the most, yeah, um, it's, the most, it's the most sustainable part of it, yeah. basically. So yeah, yeah, it's the part that, that, that's easier to be regenerated and you're not going all the way down to get that peat out from, from deep into the ground. Yeah. Perfect. Cheers, Rich. And uh, so, yeah, so we use that peat. Uh, so we build a wee wood fire and there's a grate on top of the wood fire. And on that, we put our peat. Um, and then on top of our peat, we put an extra special Scandi ingredient. Uh, we actually put juniper twigs. Um, they're the other resinous little bloody taste of flavour that they are. Um, <laughs> and we use them on top of the peat. So we get quite a nice, really good smoky resinous effect. Um, that goes through to, to dry our barley. So we're one, of the, we're one of the very few distilleries in the world that still hand smoke and malt our peated barley. Um, so less than 10 that we know of, that we're aware of. Um, so it's about 10, less than 10. Um, so yeah, so we, we've got our, our own smoker uh, and malt floor uh, next, next door to the distillery in an old chipping container. Uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, and, and our main man, Hakan, uh, looks after that. Um, and he regenerates that peat fire every four hours uh, over a three-day period. Uh, it's pretty intense. We do it three times a year, uh, I, I believe. Uh, and, yeah, it's it's absolutely fantastic. So, as I said, we we bought a peat around Barney on site. Uh so why do we do that? Why don't we just buy peated barley? And well, uh, Viking Maltins, who make our elegant recipe, don't have a peating process. So what we used to do in the early days, at least, was go up there. The founders would go up to Viking Maltins uh, and hand shovel uh, into big wheelbarrows and stuff like that, uh, peated barley to take back, uh, to put in our own, at the time, our own, what we call our R&D smoker, our research and development smoker, which was... Um, at one of the founders' houses, uh, and there it is there. So we've got the, the peat floor to the right uh, and the smoker to the left. Uh, but the neighbours in that area, it was a bit more of a residential area, the neighbours there uh, complained a little bit, unfortunately, <laughs> um, as, you know, potentially you might do. Uh, so we had to move it to another one of the founders' houses, uh, out to their beach house, where you can see there on the shoreline, so that can be easily... You know the smoke can be easily uh, put out to sea, etc. So it doesn't doesn't annoy as as many people, if if, if anybody. Um, so yeah, so that that's that's that for the peating. But um, we actually peat to quite a high ppm. So if anybody doesn't know, ppm stands for parts per million, and that means the phenolic content. So that peated flavour. Um, we actually peat to sixty ppm, which is really high. So some of the more famous guys out there, like Ardberg, uh, Lagavulin, Lefroy, etc., are in the, the the low to the low to high forties into the very early fifties uh, for their ppm levels. No, but we peak, we we peak to sixty ppm, which you think, wow, that's going to be really really strong, but it's not. And there's a couple of reasons why not. Um, the biggest reason is we actually only use twenty three percent. Of that of that peated barley, in with our elegant recipe to make the rook recipe, uh, and then obviously you you lose about two thirds of that ppm through the distillation process anyway. So you what you're going to get in your glass is um, really quite low 
uh, on the PPM and smokiness than, than you'd expect from a 60 PPM, quite frankly. So put it into context, into proper numbers, because I'm rubbish with, with percentages. We do a 1,500 kilogram batch of, of barley, uh, of malted barley for uh, for a run. Uh, and when we do a peated run, 350 kilograms, about 1,500 kilograms, is our uh, our peated barley. Uh, so just to put that into, into like proper numbers for you. Uh, so that's why you're not going to get 60 ppm uh, in the, the whole mash bill anyway. Uh, so that's that's good. Um, yeah. Nick, it's always, I always think when we get to the fifth dram of the night as well, because it's, it's important that we talk about this stuff, but it's just numbers flying at people, yeah. who are, who are five, five, including me, who are, you know, five, five, five drams deep and just trying to trying to keep up and, and catch up with it. But, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully there are people in the audience tonight that appreciate this level of detail and, and geekiness because, um, you know, I, I think it's, uh, it's it's interesting to have it and and that transparency as well. I think. Oh, um, no, so hey, I, I don't know if, if Laura is 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 talking about having met um, um, me perhaps at the whiskey fair in Hazelmere because my or or if, if Laura lets know if, if it's just um, if you were there uh, uh, before I I think I did the evening shift. My first ever shift, sorry, I should say, for Matt Mira was at the whiskey fair, the whiskey affair in Hazelmere, 28th of February last year. And um, I did the evening shift. Gareth, our, our colleague, Mick, did um, did the first half. And, um, yeah, that's my first one. I think that was one of about five outings that I went on before lockdown came in. And you and I have been sat in these same chairs for the teams meetings that we have, for the tastings that we do, you know, for uh, for fourteen months or so now. But um, yeah. Laura, if we if we if we did meet at, at Hazelmere, hopefully uh, we'll see you again there for for the next one. We're hoping to be at the Whiskey Affair in Reading in November. Um, should it go ahead? So uh, if you can get yourself to to Reading, uh, come and come and say hello. But yeah, Mick, let's get back to the maths. Definitely. No, I'm done with maths now, Rich. Let's get. <laughs> Let's get on to tasting what we really think of it properly. Uh, yeah. So is anybody out there that wasn't, that was put off by Pete before? Because uh, we get this quite a lot. And I take it as a big compliment that people go, oh, I was a bit, I was a bit, um, you know, there's a bit of trepidation before trying this one because I'm not a Pete fan, but I tried it and now I love it. Uh, so, yeah, uh, let us know if you weren't a Pete fan before, but now you've just tried the look and actually you're coming around to, to, to Smokey. Oh yeah, they, they met you, Rich. That's good. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully, we can all have a, a, a drink in 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 three D again sometime soon. You know, actually in person yeah. somewhere. Um, yeah, yeah, but what, what you said, Mick, about oh, sorry, go on. So I'm just saying, uh, Kevin thinks this, this uh, as like you said before, memories of a bonfire in the ring. Yeah, dancing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah like that's, that's in the dark on the beach with friends. Lovely. That that's a, a tasting note that I've um, I've stolen from, from a friend of mine who I occasionally give credit to for it. Other times I just take it as my own. But um, he, he had a nose of, of this for the first time, um, you know, the better part of a year ago now, and said to him, "It's it, it, yeah, campfire in the rain," which I mm. think is, is a lovely tasting note in of yep. itself. And also, I think actually, you know, um, quite apt for this because it does it, it's. There's smoke to it, and there's this sort of there's this like wood smoke to it, yeah. campfire. But there's also there's like um, you know, I, I don't know how to describe it other than like a, a dampness, like a wet smoke. Yeah, something there like is, that. There is, yeah, yeah, and, is. and that's camp campfire on the rain. Someone else described it to us, Mick. I think on a tasting as um, like the 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 day after a barbecue, and it was yeah. rained overnight. You come back and you you stood near that barbecue then, and and yeah. a light rain is is bringing up some of that. You know that that charcoal dust or, or yeah. whatever it is. You know, so a, 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 a gone out barbecue in the rain as well. I suppose you could uh, you could throw in there. Nice, no, 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 lovely comment, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, love this dram, so unique. Uh, oh, there we go. Perfect example, of Mandy. Thank you very much. Not a massive fan of peat whiskey, but this is lovely. I would happily drink this one. Perfect. Uh, oh. Jamie, sorry to see you go, pal. Uh, so you got to go. Thanks very much, guys. Incredible tasting evening. Bjork's having a look. Wonderful. Happy with that. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for being uh, here. Oh, no. I, no that, that's a compliment right there. Thank you very much, mm -hmm. Mr. Bord, indeed. He likes Lefroig, but this he likes this one better. Rook is the only PT whiskey. No E, of course. Well done, Tom. Uh, that passes must on how to. Obviously, Tom was on for the other week where I went on my mini no e run. <laughs> I think you you and I alternate tastings, Mick. You you'll, you'll have a rant one week. I, I mean, I, I ranted about smooth earlier, 
I usually have a, a rant, which I managed to skip today, about draft yeah, yeah. and happy cows and things. We, we bypassed it um, quite well. So I think uh, next time you, you can go off on one again about the E in whiskey or not. Um, yeah, but that, but uh, again, some of these comments coming in, and, and Tom says, you know, about only Peter Whiskey that passes muster there. Which I think we hear that all the time from people, don't we, about how, you know, they, they didn't like peated whiskey before because their perception of it was that all peated whiskey were these big, enormous drams yeah. from, from Isla, you know, um, let's say, you know, the south southeast, is it the Kildalton coast on Isla, you know, the um, Lefroig, Arbeg, Lagavulin, Lagavulin. Um, and how you know big uh, lots of iodine and TCP and and heavy smoke to it. Whereas this, big old flavors, yeah. This is this is different. This has got smoke to it, but it's not it's not the same as that at all. And that's um, a, a, a large part of that. Well, to do, I mean, there's little nuances that can be discussed, of course. But the fact that the the peat is different. So wherever you get your peat from, whatever um, bio matter has gone into making that peat, whatever plants were above it before and, you know, over the, the centuries and the millennia, you know, going down and down, um, whatever, what, whatever bio matter has gone into making it will have, an, well, not just an enormous influence on the, you know, it, it, it determines what flavor or what, you know, properties it's going to have in there. So wherever your peat comes from, will uh, will will have a big difference, um, from, from one place to the next in terms of flavors. Definitely. And I forgot to mention as well, the, the name of the bog where we, where we get our peat from is called the Karen Mossen, or the Bog of Karens, as I, I now affectionately name it. It is called the Karen Bog, but I just call it the Bog of Karens now, uh, just because I like that, really. We've only had read one Karen on before uh, who didn't mind it being called that, so that's fine. I'll say, if, any, if anyone wants to... If anyone wants to score that joke of mix as well, let us know what you think of that. You could. Uh... Oh, joke! It's just a rewording of it. That's, that's not a joke. It's just what it's called. <laughs> so Ian, Ian Morris loves a peaty whiskey. He's off to the Freud in September, uh, yeah. as long as Boris's roadmap stays on track. But, mm. but Ian, doesn't matter about Boris's. When you come above that wall, you have to apply to Nicola's roadmap. Important, so, important to consider. It's not happening, Sam. So. Just yeah, I'll say, um, <laughs> I'll say I'll say to Ian, you know, talking about peat and things there. Um, if you if you go to the front, I'm not sure if you've ever been there before, Ian. Let's know if if you have. But you can go and, uh, and adopt basically a, a square yard in their, their their peat bogs opposite the distillery. So you can go and um, they give you little GPS coordinates so that you can go and you can look on your phone. You can find out where you need to be, and you, you take some flags that they have in the distillery visitor center, and you can go out and plant your you know plant your your um, national flag, if that is, you know, if you've got something like that, um, go and, um, and plant that and uh, and claim uh, your your land, basically. Um, I think it's on loan. I'm not sure that you actually have any, any particular right to it, but it's very fun you get to do. I will advise taking um, Wellington boots because otherwise you, you've got no chance of getting across there. A friend of mine tried doing it in trainers and uh, we laughed at him for the rest of the day um, with his, his, his soggy shoes. But uh, rather foolish man. Other friends of mine are, are smarter than that, I'll just say quickly, in case any are listening. Fantastic. So I think, uh, we're going to have to start to wrap up there, ladies and gentlemen. So any final comments, uh, any final shout-outs, please, uh, please whack them in uh, while we begin to wrap up. Um, yeah, let's know what your favourite's been as well. And we'll, we'll try and have a quick count-up as well as, as just before we say goodnight. Uh, so while, we, while you guys get your favourites in and stuff like that, uh, what you do it saying uh, the keys in the name I suppose yet, yeah, but didn't realize they went from wooden ships to wooden metal. Yeah, so it's ironclad uh, around the woods. It was like an armor type type thinking uh, before they went full metal alone. Yeah, uh, I didn't know that, Nick. And all things. I didn't know that, and I don't want to go into you know down a rabbit hole now as we try and sort of you know wrap things up. But um, but but it seems to me that seems you, you have it something that's too top heavy. That's that's liable to 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 capsize yeah. things you'd have to be quite so a good amount of weight in the keel for something yeah. like that obviously I mean, at the time uh, naval architecture wasn't what it is now uh, or has been so the idea behind ironclad was mainly the hull not so much the superstructure type stuff which is the top the stuff uh like the furniture above deck really so like all your mass and things like that so that wasn't really so your hull was mainly uh, ironclad so it was to think along the lines of like suit of armor uh, for for the wooden structure of it, really, and it was a cost as well because obviously you know metal wasn't as readily available back then either. Nice, yeah, yeah. There you go, Kevin. It's um, it's there's 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 good reason for that. The uh, uh, the 
the the peats on Isla, um, sphagnum moss is basically what the, the predominant um, uh, contributor to the, the peat there. That's uh, and its properties end up giving you big medicinal notes to it. And also this the, the sphagnum moss's roots go so far down into the ground, and with all that sea spray coming off, it's giving it it's a you know a, a Hebridean island. Um, lots and lots of, of salt from that that spray and you know just in the air in general and the rain even um, gets really far down into that earth so you've just got this really salty um, end up you know medicinal sort of notes from from the moss going into it as well but salty medicinal notes um, from yeah from the the, the peak there and um, yeah if you look at, at highland peat it's uh, you know a lot of heather goes into it so you get sort of sweeter smoke perhaps from highland peat and that there are whiskies uh, made on isla that use um highland scotland peat rather than just uh isla peat themselves or a mix of the two i think but more use a mix of the two um yeah so let us know let us know what your your favorite swear as mick said and um while we see some of them comments come in mick not not a bad time maybe to talk well, about Robert, the Robert, well. it had to be there for Robert Brilliant. Yeah. So Rich, before we wrap up, would you care to remind us of our deal for our lovely our lovely people that joined us this evening, please? Yeah, so we can see a little bit of it ticking across the bottom there. Um code um Bjorksav40 at uh, checkout at macmira.co.uk. That's if you buy a bottle of uh, if you add a bottle of Bjorksav to your cart and um and, and use the code bjorksav 40 uh, if you've got a bottle of the core range in there as well you'll get 40 percent off of that core range bottle so um to make that uh, a less a bit convoluted of uh, an explanation um buy a bottle of bjorksav um and uh, use the code bjorksav 40 to get 40 percent off of a core range bottle i think there that's it so, only until midnight tonight, and the, the core range, um, our core range, are the four others that we've tried this evening as well. So, Bjorksad being the seasonal, the others being the core range. So that's it. That, that's 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 the deal. We can see the details running across the bottom there. Um, while we're seeing uh, those other comments come through, Mick, I'll just say the the shows we've got coming up. So tomorrow, yes. anyone anyone that um, that would like to come and join Mick and I for uh, for the last of our post Friday work end of the working week um, drinks at our virtual pub, the Mac Mirror Inn. Um, join us at 6 p.m. tomorrow on uh, on Facebook or YouTube where we're joined by Claire Vokins here. Um, whiskey blogger, works for you know, Boutique Whiskey Company, Milroy's of Soho. Um, lots of work, um, uh, charity work and things that she does uh, as well. Uh, really just, she's just a, a lovely person. So uh, come and join us. And uh, she's a good crack as well. And uh, see what there's, there's a few things she said that, you know, we, she'd like to talk about tomorrow. And I think there'll be... Um, you, you know, we've got, we've, we're going to have a live one, Mick. We'll have our hands full. We'll have our hands full. We'll have <laughs> we will. We will. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's it tomorrow. Um, next week, uh, we don't have any shows uh, next week. We don't have the inn next week. And that's because uh, as uh, as the UK or in England, at least, uh, you know, allowing people to go back out and uh, and play outside a little bit, uh, we're moving the inn, the MacMere Inn, to Wednesday. So Wednesday the 21st, we're joined uh, by Dave Pennington, who's been with us in the comments tonight, and Phil Walker from the new union in Kendall, which I think I've got right. Mick hasn't jumped in. To new say union much. In, in Kendall. <laughs> new union in, it, comma, I had in my mind. New union in, comma, Kendall. But the new union in, in Kendall, um, uh, lots of lots of whiskies uh, on offer there. I met Phil with you, Mick, um, a few weeks ago when he came to join us for the launch of, of your yeah. show. Um, Top bloke. Yeah. Haven't met Dave yet. Looking forward to him uh, meeting him. As you know, I've seen some good comments from him tonight. And uh, yeah, they, we will be talking at some point, I'm sure, about the upcoming Kendall Whiskey Festival, which they are founding um, later this year, uh, of which we will be the um, the main sponsor for. So um, that's something that, uh, that you tickets will be available come May. Come May. There we go. And um, very much looking forward to that. I'll be speaking to Shane, our boss, about coming to support you up at that festival. That's for sure. Um, that's well, it. That's the next couple of things. On yeah, that's the next thing we've got coming up. We will have another um, another what, exact one of these tastings uh, in the coming weeks too. So anyone that enjoyed it and thinks they might want to get friends or family in, involved with the next one, um, check out mattmirror.co.uk and you'll be able to see the next dates for this. 28th of April, and we have a special guest to uh, to present uh, Bjork South with us as well. And that will be our good friend, uh, the spirit specialist, uh, Ben Bowers, will join us for, for that tasting, Rich. We'll come and do some of the work for us for the evening as well. We can yeah. sit back a little bit and uh, yeah, put our feet up. So yeah, let's have a look. So what, what are people's favourites, Mick? So I think hopefully you've been um, keeping, keeping up. So Robert likes the, the Rook. 
kind of firing them through. For Mandy, it was the Eck, nice. So Bjorks have lovely, lovely. But love the books. Yeah. Well, Tom's had a few before anyway, so it's fits good look for Ian. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Third in, December 3rd and 4th. Uh, tickets available in May. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, Favourite tonight was the uh, Bjorks have. Nice one, Laura. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, but pick up your red. Michael I for his, um, for his plot at, at Lefroy. Uh, yeah, oh, no, yeah uh, definitely. Uh, definitely must thank Angela for sure. Uh, Rook followed by Ek and then Matt. Nice. Can't choose between them. Lovely. Nice one, David. Uh, need to get across to Karaj Koga once I'm allowed. I, okay. Um, I'll take your word for that, Kevin. My, my geography is rubbish, believe it or not. Uh, awesome fresh whiskey. Oh, brilliant, Adam. Uh, Brooks Whiskey was your favourite full of body Bjorks have. Fantastic. Nice. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Michael. Great tasting. Really enjoyed the evening and learned a lot. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. We'll be back to hear your rant about the E and Whiskey <laughs> RB. Don't. Honestly, don't. <laughs> Neil, thanks, guys. Favourite Brooks. Lovely. Uh, very informative. Great present, bro. Uh, oh, there you go. Uh, happy birthday, Neil. Um, thanks for a great night as ever. The whiskey was amazing. See you on the 21st. Definitely, Dave. Without questionable doubt, good sir. Uh, but, uh, thank you very much, Mandy. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, great as always, chat. Uh, thanks, everyone. Keep safe. Brilliant. Guys, honestly, uh, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Your interaction has been amazing. Uh, me and Rich can't really do these things without you. Because uh, we'd just be talking to each other as per normal. So <laughs> we don't want to have that. So please. Uh, we enjoy. I mean, we I, I enjoy your company, Mick. I will say, but the, you know, it, it's nice to have other people in the mix. I would say that as well. Exactly, you know? exactly, Rich. Exactly, we do lots together. We do lots together. So it's nice to invite other people in occasionally. Um, so, no, guys. Honestly, thank you very much so much. Uh, please uh, like, subscribe, and do all those other good social media things uh, across our Facebook, our Instagram, our YouTube. Uh, and all those, and on our Twitter, I always forget about Twitter. Uh, so yeah, please uh, interact with us. Tell all your pals if you've had a good time, and come and join us for the next one, and especially for the in tomorrow night. Uh, so, Rich, good night from me. Good night from me. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Shkong. Good night. Yeah. Have yeah. a have a good time. <laughs>